Welcome to the DFBM, which is Best Friend Bread Machine, Making Friends with Your Bread Machine. So um, I'm Beth Hilson. I'm the food editor at Gluten Free and More. Um, many of you, I imagine, know that magazine already. Um, some of you may even have this issue already, um, which the recipes are from. Um, if you don't, you can pick that up at the Gluten Free and More table. Um, they're charging $5 for the issue, but for $23 you can get two years uh, of subscription for uh, the price of one plus a free current issue, which is this one. So anyway, so enough about, uh, well actually I've got a few more promotion things to tell you about too, but, um, but I did want to let you know about that. Um, we have a great baking issue as well that's available. Ah, I want to compete with that. And um, this issue is free as well. So I'd love to have you stop by there. I also have two. I have a brand new book that's come out. It's hot off the press. It's not even really out yet. Um, and I'm happy to sign copies of it. It's a living well gluten-free book, everything you need to know, including some recipes for things that you thought you could never have again and how to make them. Um, this is a wonderful book that I was one of the editors on and also the, one of the celebrity chefs for Gluten-Free and More. Um, and it's full of recipes from soup to nuts, a great inspiration with all of the fall baking and holidays coming up. And this is my book from 2011, I think. Um, which is how to make over all of your favorite recipes. And um, you probably know that I'm the substitution queen. So we talk about how to replace things. And that's really been my, my mantra ever since I was diagnosed with celiac disease. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself because I think it's relevant to what we're doing. And before I forget, let me introduce my friend, the bread machine tell you more about him in a little bit in a few more minutes he is my best friend although he's not coming on the airplane with me when I go home to Connecticut he's going out to Portland and he's gonna get shipped he's a little heavy for me anyway so I was diagnosed with celiac disease twice the first time was when I was a child I don't even want to mention the date because it really puts me in an old age which dinosaur age but um, that was back in the day when all they did was take away all starches and sugars never mentioned the word gluten in fact they didn't really know it was about gluten and they gave me bananas to eat and <laughs> so I had a lot of bananas um, and I ate um, raisins and dates and I cottage cheese and I think a soy formula which you know are things that they probably wouldn't do now and it took about four years before I got back to eating everything um, and at that point I was quote cured which we know is not true but that's what they told me then and what they thought um, so I was cured and I went happily on my way eating breads and having a great old time until I was re-diagnosed um, in 1976 and by the way there wasn't much out there then either so I started baking my way back to health learning what I could do to to um, to live well to bake well and eat well because there wasn't a whole lot out there um, and so um, about 1993 uh, my son was diagnosed with celiac disease as well and my sister was diagnosed in 2005 so we have a lot of it in the family um, we do mostly gluten-free cooking and baking almost entirely once in a while we'll have a French bread for my brother-in-law or my husband but that's about it um, I want to read a little bit from the book because it's called it's a gut reaction and those are my personal essays and it's called the big chew a history of bread the first time I was diagnosed with celiac disease as a young child I ate a lot of bananas fried mashed with dates wrapped in Canadian bacon and broiled indeed it was a strange but fascinating menu I ate broiled steak cottage cheese and all the butter I wanted but there was no bread the word gluten was never mentioned 
but for more than three years, no starches or sugars came across my plate. Gradually, corn, rice, potatoes, wheat reappeared. At that time, I was pronounced cured. Okay, fast forward to the time I was about 22 years old and traveling in Europe, and I fell in love with brochen, croissant, and all the good breads that were there. Um, dipping hard rolls and cafe au lait was one of my passions. So I came, I came back to the United States, lived with two roommates who made whole wheat bread every Friday afternoon. And we would cut slices of that bread, slather them with honey and butter, and eat those. And that was the way I started every weekend. Oh my gosh. Okay, so my DNA was imprinted with great breads at that point. But in 1976, it was all taken away from me again. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get healthy because I've taken gluten out of my diet and I feel so much better. But at the same time, I'm not going to have decent bread anymore. And I don't know, were any of you diagnosed with celiac disease way back when? How many of you have celiac disease? Ah, okay. So, if um, let me just go back into the history a little bit and tell you that bread in those days was basically methyl cellulose and starches. And you could bounce it off the wall, you could drop it, you could use it as a, a doorstop, but you couldn't eat the stuff. So it was really unpleasant to even try to digest it. I mean, I would sit there and chew a piece of bread for hours and hours and hours. About early 1980s, we started to get gums in, uh, available to individual consumers. And to me, that was the biggest breakthrough in gluten-free baking. Because once we had gums, then we could add a little bit of elasticity and stretchability to rice flour. And by then, if you think about um, yeast, yeast needs an environment to expand in, kind of like bubble gum. So, if you don't have that elasticity, you really, you might get a taste of yeast, but you're not going to get a great rise out of it. So, once we had the gums, I think we really had the beginnings of a breakthrough in decent breads. Um, about 1990-something, after my son was born, I said, I made a commitment to myself that I was never going to go without a decent piece of bread. Once I had found it, I wasn't going to let it go. So in order to do that, I had to bake it myself. And in order to bake it, because I was a busy mother and also a writer, I had to mix it. And what was I going to do? I mean, it was an alchemy of flowers and gum and yeast. And every time I wanted to bake a bread, it was a big deal. So in order to do that and save myself some time, I took about six bags of uh, baggies and I would measure out my flowers. And I'd put them in a bag, shake it up so that I could mix it really easily, and I put on it what it was, and I said no yeast, and I put it in the refrigerator. So every time I wanted a bread, I got out my bread machine, added my liquids, my dry flowers, and my yeast, and in two hours I had a bread. No wonder I love my bread machine. You would too if this was your connection to life. So um, I have to tell you a little secret. This was the beginning of Gluten Free Pantry, which is a company I founded in 1993. Um, and that's how I started with mixes, because I said, well, gee, I mean, this is really so easy for me. Maybe some other people want to know this too. Well, guess what? I mean, I bought a 50-pound bag of rice flour and I thought, oh, I might get a couple of other people interested in buying some of my mixes so that I didn't have to spend all that money and let the, the rice flour kind of ferment on my step. And so I started to put um, a notice out to a few support groups. This was around February or March of 1993. By July, I was so inundated with orders that I had no bread for myself anymore. So, <laughs> so that was the beginning of gluten-free pantry. Um, and uh, the company, I sold the company in 2005, 
um, to Glutino, which is here, by the way. Um, but I stayed with the company and um, the mixes and the products are still on the shelves. I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with them, but Favorite Sandwich Bread was my first mix. And it's still out there and it's still, I have a fondness for it as well as for my bread machine. We're all connected with our gluten-free DNA. So anyway, I want to tell you that gluten-free bread is not a thing of the past. How many of you have bread machines? Ah, okay. And um, how, what brands do you have? Can somebody just shout out the names of them? I don't know if we can hear you. Cuisine art, okay. And anybody else want to? What kind of machine do you have? Rival? Okay, uh huh, okay. There are a number of bread machines out there that have a gluten free cycle now, and those that are included Tifal, West Bend, Sojirushi, which is the one I'm using here, Hamilton Beach, Oster, Breville. Bread Man, um, those are just a few of them. So anyway, so we're all um, a family here with our own best friends. Um, have any of you had any difficulties making your breads? You're all happy with what you're, oh, some people are saying yes. Okay, good, all right. So we'll try to solve some of those problems for you as well. Um, so, I mean, one of the issues with, you know, what is gluten after all? You know, it's a protein, and it adds that beautiful elasticity and structure that we're all missing because we're removing that from our flours and from our baking. Um, so we have to try really hard to put that back, and gum is just one of the ways that we can do that. Um, but let me tell you before that, that um, the nice thing about gluten-free bread is that it's more like a batter than it is like something that you can knead. Have any of you ever made homemade whole wheat bread? You know how beautiful that is when you knead it and you can keep adding more flour to it and it grows and grows and grows. You can put it in the refrigerator overnight and it doubles in size. I mean, all these wondrous things, they're not gonna happen with gluten-free bread. It's gonna be really harder than that. Um, and I was always amazed because I had learned to bake uh, gluten-filled breads before I realized that nailing the flour was not very good for me either. So um, gluten-free bread is more like a batter. Um, because of that, it only needs one mixing cycle or kneading cycle and one rise cycle. And if you add more of those, which is typical for uh, wheat breads, you're really going to deflate the dough and you're gonna deflate your bread. So you really just want to do the one, one rise, uh, one knead and one rise cycle. So that means that your bread, instead of being four hours from start to finish, can be done in less than two. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. So, and now we've got so many great flours that we can make um, our breads much more easily and have really delicious flavored breads. I mean, rice flour is wonderful. It serves a purpose, but it doesn't add a lot of flavor to baking. So we're gonna talk a little bit about adding flavor as well. Um, the other reason that gluten-free breads are difficult to handle is because we're adding a lot of gums. Okay, the gum is sticky. If any of you have ever had a little bit of xanthan gum that's landed on your counter and you try to wipe it up with a damp sponge, what happens? You know, it's like you're handling um, a dead fish. You know, it's like slimy and oh, it's really hard to get off. So anyway, I mean, it's great when you blend it with flour because it really does serve a very functional purpose, but um, it's very sticky. So we don't, can't handle our dough very much. And if you're going to handle it, you want to handle it through plastic wrap that's been sprayed with a little bit of vegetable oil because that way you won't allow the dough to get stuck to your fingers. Um, Gluten-free dough, when you stick it to your fingers, it's kind of like Velcro because then you touch the dough a little bit more, you get more dough on your fingers. And before you know it, half the dough is in your hand. And scraping it off is a real pain, so we don't want to go there. Okay, so 
Um, the nice thing about a bread machine is that you add your ingredients in the order that the bread machine tells you, the liquids and then the dry and then the yeast on top in the case of the Zoe. And I imagine most machines are like that these days. And then you press start. The only thing that you really want to do is you want to come back and check it. And we're also going to talk about a bread doctor thing, which is to fix your ailing breads. Um, but you do want to scrape down the sides if you can so that you don't have a band of dry flour around the finished bread. Other than that, it's all done for you. I'm going to... Ah, this is starting to bake. So I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to lift this. If everybody wants to stand up for a second and take a look, um, this is what... I don't know if you can see this, but this is the way the bread is looking and it's baking right now. Okay, that's it. <laughs> no more peeking. <laughs> because that bread will, will deflate if we let it, if we get the air in there anymore. And I want to give you a taste of this. I'm making a pumpernickel bread right now. So many people don't like the light rye style breads because of caraway seeds. Um, but this one's a hearty bread. It has a little bit of uh, unsweetened cocoa in it. It has cornmeal in it. It has a little decaffeinated coffee powder. And so it has a really hearty taste and it has molasses for sweetener. Um, it does have a little bit of milk powder in it. So I want to mention that ahead of time. If any of you are severely lactose intolerant, um, if you can't take it, you know, if it's too much for you baked, um, then I would avoid this. But you can make your own and use the substitutions. We have a number of them in the magazine. Um, we could talk about substitutions in a few minutes as well. Um, other than that, you're just really going to just press the start button and let it go. Now, I want to tell you that this has a wonderful gluten-free cycle. The gluten-free cycle is about two hours, two and a half hours. And that was a little more than I wanted today. I have a Zojirushi from 1995, and I'm still using it. And it's really old, and it doesn't, it's kind of whitish yellow because it's been used so much and loved so much. But it has a home bake cycle in it, and I had that programmed. And so all of my bread is programmed for about an hour and 55 minutes. This one is about two hours and three minutes, and I used a custom cycle. Um, so I didn't use the gluten-free cycle this time. I often do, but I wanted to make sure that we had bread for you to taste before you leave, so I had to time it that way. But one of the things that you want to look for if you're buying a new machine, and for those of you who have a really old one and you're thinking of retiring it, you might want to add a new bread machine to your list for Christmas. Um, or Hanukkah because that's really I mean you'll just get so much use out of it I think um, so there are several factors you want to look at when you're buying a bread machine price is one thing this one is the Cadillac and it's about $250 um, but you can get a bread machine for as little as $65 so anywhere between $65 and $250 you can buy yourself a really nice bread machine with a number of features in it. Um, this has a lot of complex technology in it, so I think maybe that's one of the reasons it's more expensive. Um, it also holds up very well. I, I can attest to that from previous uh, iterations of the machine that I've had. The other thing that you might want to consider is the size. Okay, do you want a one pound loaf, one and a half, or two pound? This makes a one and a half to two pound loaf. Um, I, I figure if you're going to go to the trouble, you might as well have a big loaf of bread. You can slice up the rest of it. This will stay for, this recipe will stay for two or three days on your counter, and then you can slice the rest and freeze it. Um, but if you don't eat bread that quickly, you might want a one-pound bread machine. Um, this, the loaf itself is another thing to consider, a horizontal or a vertical loaf. Now, if you're doing a vertical loaf, how many of you have a machine with a vertical loaf? And does it sometimes give you trouble when you're mixing it? That you might have a little bit, you don't have trouble with it. Oh, good. Okay. Because some of the old machines used to leave a little bit of the flour on the top because the, the single blade would have to go all the way up to the top of the vertical loaf in order to blend everything. And that sometimes, if that happens, you may have to assist it with your rubber spatula my other friend, another best friend, um, and just mix it a little bit. 
Okay, and we'll talk more about that because we're going to talk about the bread doctor and analyzing our breads in a minute. The paddles are another issue. Okay, this one has two paddles. Um, if you have a vertical loaf, you have one paddle. And you want to make sure it's strong enough so that it's going to mix our doughs because the gluten-free doughs are a little bit denser in texture. And then we've got the gums besides. So as you probably have experienced, some of those doughs get a little bit thick, a little bit glommy. Like that word? <laughs> and then, um, you know, and they can be hard to mix. So for some of the bread machines, just like some of our not so heavy duty handheld mixers, we can really burn out um, our, our appliances simply by mixing our doughs in them. So you want to consider that when you're looking for a bread machine. Cycles and settings, I mentioned the custom bake and the gluten-free cycle. A lot of them, I think the cuisine art and some of the others that you mentioned. How many of you have a gluten-free cycle on your bread machine? Okay, good, okay. For those of you who don't, add that to your list when you're ordering it, when you're putting a wish list together. Um, it is really helpful. Um, or if you don't, you could do a custom um, uh, setting and that will help you as well to um, eliminate the extra knead and rise cycle. If you don't have that, you can always use the white bread cycle or the shortest cycle in your bread machine. And you want to look at your manual to see how long each one is. Because um, like whole wheat, for instance, can be three hours and 30 minutes to four hours. And that's obviously going to have three rises and three kneads in it. You don't want that because that's really not going to be a friend to your bread. But if you do white bread or short, don't use a quick bread cycle, but a shorter cycle um, is like two hours and 30 minutes, that can work pretty well for you. Um, so your mix, let's talk about the mix for a minute. Okay, we want a mix of dry ingredients, liquids, gum, and yeast. Okay, our dry ingredients are gonna be a combination of starches and flours. I like to use some of the, what I call, nutrient-dense flours. Those would be things like quinoa flour, amaranth flour, millet flour, chickpea flour, um, you may all be familiar with a number of those, and they're mostly interchangeable. They also, besides being rich in nutrients, they also have fiber, so they're good for us in many ways. They also have some protein. If you look in the amaranth, for instance, and the nutrition label, you'll see like, I think it's four or five grams of protein. Hey, that's good stuff, because you know what? Gluten is protein. So we want to add back that protein. And so if we use, but, but the other side of that is that if you use too much chickpea flour or um, quinoa flour or buckwheat flour is a good example, it's going to overpower the flavor of your bread. So we also want something that's going to taste good. So we want a little bit of the protein flour. We want some rice flour because that's our workhorse or something like sorghum flour if we can't have rice flour. Um, and then we want some starches. Tapioca starch, corn starch, potato starch are all good choices. And then gum. I always recommend using between one and one and a half teaspoons of xanthan gum per cup of flour blend in your bread machine. And that seems to work really well. I use the uh, one and a half more when the pizza doughs or the French breads um, because I find that that really adds, um, gives it a little more structure and you want a denser loaf that's going to be kind of chewy. Um, about one teaspoon is a great rule of thumb per cup. Um, the um, other things that are going to add protein to your mix are going to be things like milk powder and eggs. And I hear some of you already saying, oh, I can't have milk or I can't have eggs. Okay, it's all right because you can use substitutions. Um, I may have mentioned I'm the substitution queen. And for each egg that you have, I found that a combination of flax meal and warm water and that would be one tablespoon of flax meal for three tablespoons of warm water and let it sit for about five minutes and replace each egg with that formula with one, one of the one times that formula. 
um, and you'll have really good luck with your breads. Um, the other thing you can use, we have substitutions in the recipes um, in the magazine. Um, sometimes our test kitchen uses applesauce and a little baking powder. Sometimes they use flax meal. Sometimes they use the energy egg replacer. So you can fool around with those. You may know which ones you prefer or which ones you can tolerate. You can also use chia seed. You can use psyllium fiber. And I found that those also work very well to add structure to breads. And they work, excuse me, they work very well in the bread machine. For milk powders, okay, there are a number of powders that you can use. One of them, if any of you can tolerate um, nuts, you can use um, almond powder, which is a great substitute. There's something called Kinosaurus, which is quinoa protein. And that's a new one that's out there um, that you can use as a one-for-one -one replacement with your milk powder. Um, there are others. How many of you are uh, lactose-free? Okay. Do you have other recommendations that perhaps we can share? I know soy powder is one if you can tolerate soy. No other? Okay. Well, we can try those. Any, I mean, those would be recommended anyway. I'm glad that a lot of you can have this. Um, okay, and then for yeast, what kind of yeast are we going to use? All right, I let's stop. Let's start with the one I would not use, which is the rapid rise yeast. I think that that one may not be up to the task. I don't think you get quite the rise that you will from other breads, uh, other yeast, when you're doing breads in the bread machine that are gluten free. I like to use either the bread machine um, or the active dry yeast. And I usually use about a tablespoon for, uh, this is about three and a half cups of, of dry ingredients. Um, and I feel that that kind of gives it the maximum lift. If you use a rapid rise, I think it ferments too quickly sometimes and you might get more holes in your bread as well. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the chemistry. As you know, everything about gluten-free defies food chemistry. I mean, there is nothing familiar about this stuff. And, you know, we've kind of, all of us, I think you should give yourselves a pat on the back because we've worked our way back to almost normal, uh, and maybe in a lot of cases very normal, um, in terms of really eating well without gluten. Um, so, but there are some things about the gluten-free bread that are quite different than gluten-filled bread. Um, let's talk about the bubblegum theory first. Okay, so when you think about bubblegum, you blow a bubble and you get this tiny puny bubble. Okay, it's not really much. You're not going to win a championship with it. Um, and that's because you haven't put enough air in it. Okay? Similar with yeast. Um, then you have another one, and I've been a bubblegum champion uh, many years during high school, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> And so you get these big bubbles and some maximum tension on the bubble and it's beautiful and that's great. But then you put a little more air in it and poof and it goes all over your face. And that's the same thing that can happen with breads, with gluten-free breads. So if you add too much liquid, you're going to have a bread that's going to mushroom over the top of your pan. And if it's in a bread machine, it is not a pretty picture. So you don't want to do that. Um, have any of you ever had that fiasco happen to you? Okay. <laughs> we don't want to talk about, we won't talk about that here, but we have a support group later for those of us who had mushroom breads. And we can all talk about it and complain about complete cleaning our machines. So we're looking for that sweet spot, which is the balance of wet to dry ingredients. Think about that container of rice flour. Uh, I'm sorry, of rice that you've taken out of the Chinese restaurant. And the next day it is so brittle you can almost break your teeth on it. And what happens? Well, the moisture dries out of it. So if you want to reconstitute that rice, you're going to add a little bit of water to it, you're going to cover it with a paper towel and microwave it. Right? So if you do the right amount, you're going to get a nice fluffy rice again. It's going to reconstitute it. If you do too little, it's going to still be a little brittle and even the dog might not want it. 
if you do too much then you're going to have mushy rice flour or rice sorry um, and so you don't want to do that either um, so we want that sweet spot where you get exactly the right amount so that sweet spot is what's going to let you your yeast do the best work it can possibly do so it's going to expand to the maximum without causing it to rise too much in mushroom or rise how many of you have ever had a bread that you poked in the oven and looked at it I've had a lot of I had a few of these when I was doing gluten-free makeovers okay so you take it out of the oven, you, or you look at it when you open the oven to take it out, and you go, oh, it's gorgeous. Oh my God, what a great experiment. I, I was a success the first time. You take it out, you put it on the rack, you turn around, and my God, the thing has collapsed on itself. Okay? It had too much liquid for drying. Okay, we do not want that. We don't want to go there. Um, and let me tell you, I cannot, I was doing Grandma's Babka, which is, I think, one of my biggest triumphs in gluten-free makeovers. And it was originally, the fo I really did this from gluten-filled, from a grandmother's old babka recipe. And it was like four cups of milk to seven cups of flour. And I said, hmm, that's going to be really interesting. So when I tried it the first time, I got that result. And I was so excited. When I opened up the oven, my gosh, it was like, oh, glorious, glorious gluten-free. And you know if you've had gluten-free bread or, or gluten-filled and you feel like you have to go without it, the first time you have gluten-free bread, all of a sudden it's like such a gift. And so I thought, oh my gosh, the gods are with me. They're giving me another gift. And plus, I don't have to do this recipe again for my cookbook. Well, guess what? It took me about seven times to find the ratios. I had to keep playing with it. I finally did get exactly the right ratio and I love the recipe, but it was quite a challenge um, because gluten-free defies everything you know about food chemistry. And you know, I had to keep reminding myself that. So anyway, we um, let's talk about our bread doctor for a minute. I'm going to put my bread doctor hat on now and put my little stethoscope on. What happens when you get a bread and you mix it up and you're mixing it in the bread machine and by the way you can lift that lid as long as you want to until that bread starts to bake and then you shouldn't touch it. And I know I defied that. I, <laughs> I ignored my own recommendation a minute ago but anyway so you can look at it while it's kneading and if there it seems to be very dry and crumbly after it's had a chance for all of the liquid to blend with the dry remember that little rice uh, story or the bubblegum story and we're going to do the same thing with our bread dough we're going to add we have three tools that we need one is the rubber spatula another is a little bit of warm water and another one is a bit of flour, a gluten-free flour. Okay, so if it's dry and crumbly and it looks like it's, what we're looking for is a smooth and shiny finish to our dough when it's starting to mix. If we're not getting that, then we want to add a little more water. Well, we certainly don't want to add a lot of water. And we want to add warm water because now it's gone through the warming cycle. It's gone through the rest cycle where it could have warmed everything. So we don't want to chill our yeast. So we're going to add a little bit of warm water, but we're going to add a teaspoon or two at a time until we get that beautiful consistency. We're looking for something that's about as thick as mashed potatoes, a little bit thinner perhaps, a little smoother, with a little structure to it because we're going to see the strands of protein because we've used protein and gums in our, our blend. Um, but we don't want anything that's as thin as pancake batter. If it's as thin as pancake batter, you're going to have mushrooms and collapsed bread on your hands when it comes out, guaranteed. Okay, so if it's really thin and perhaps you've added too much water to it, add a little bit of flour. Sprinkle it over the top, one tablespoon at a time. 
Use your spatula in both cases, by the way, if you're using, if you're doing, adding more liquid or you're adding more dry. And you're going to mix it in together. And even if the paddles are still moving, don't worry about it because it's not going to hurt the spatula and the spatula is not going to hurt your, your um, paddles. So you're just going to smooth it out and you're going to do a little bit of doctoring by hand until you get that right consistency. The texture, once you get that texture, you will know it. Um, and you will be able to achieve that every time. It's really, and once you get that formula, then you can begin to do your substitutions, okay? If you don't want molasses, you can use honey, or you can use more liquid of one sort or another. You can use more water. As long as you have your same ratios of liquid to dry ingredients, you will have success every time. And so really with those tools, you can work with your bread machine to have great breads. Um, I did remind you that we want to scrape down um, the sides of the dough, in, of the batter, in the middle of the knead cycle because otherwise you're going to have a rim of dry flour on the outside of it, which is not very pretty. It tastes okay, it'll flake off, but you know, why not add it all to your mix? Plus it may be the reason that you're not getting the full consistency in your um, the bread that you want. Um, if my bread machine calls for about a, a one and a half pound to two pound loaf is about uh, three to four cups of flour to about one and three quarters cups of liquid plus your eggs or egg substitute. But if you're using a one pound machine you're going to want to reduce everything by a third because a one pound loaf, uh, one pound machine will, will um, probably need about two to three cups of dry um, flour. So um, just keep that in mind when you're making your, your breads. The other thing to keep in mind is don't fool around with your ratios once you've achieved the ratio you like. That's the key to a successful makeover of any sort. Um, just keep those ratios in mind because again it's just like the bubble gum theory or the rice container theory you want just that sweet spot that's going to give you the best texture in what you're making um, so here's a question that I bet some of you might be asking right now what if you don't have a bread machine or what if you don't want to use the bread machine Okay, I bet, were you asking? Okay, and I want to see how I'm doing time-wise. I've got a few minutes, I think, and enough time for questions. So, if you don't have a bread machine, hey, no sweat. You know, use your KitchenAid or use your heavy-duty handheld mixer. Um, you can get those Black & Decker, KitchenAid, uh, Cuisine Art, all make a heavy-duty, about 250-watt handheld mixer. You're going to put all your dry ingredients except your yeast in that bowl and you can mix it right there with your blend with your beaters um, add your yeast to it and then blend it again because you want that to be dispersed evenly and then mix your liquids and you want them to be about 110 degrees because that's where the yeast is the happiest above 120 the yeast is dead you don't want that um, below it's going to really have to work very hard to rise so mix all your ingredients together, your eggs. Sometimes I even like to have my, um, my liquids, my water or my milk a little bit warmer and then I add the eggs to it cold um, or I add a little bit of the liquid to the eggs first so they don't coddle and then add it back and add my flour, my oil and my sweetener if I'm using molasses or something. And then um, add it to my dry ingredients and I'm gonna blend it for about five minutes if you do this, you'll see those strands pull away from the side of the bowl as you're beating. And that's your test. And it might be good to do that once anyway, just so you get a sense of looking at how you build up the strands of protein in your bread. Um, once you've done that, you can scrape it into your pan. Use the pan that's, uh, that the recipe calls for. If you use a larger pan and you let it rise to the top, you're gonna have, you may have bigger holes in your bread than you want. Um, so use the bread pan that is prescribed and cover it with a little bit of oil plastic wrap or a little bit of oil parchment paper and keep it in a draft-free area because the yeast doesn't like drafts 
and let it rise just to the top or almost to the top of your pan. And then pop it in your preheated oven. You got a bread. And actually in some cases that's actually faster if you've got a really warm kitchen than doing it um, in a bread machine. Bread machine is like there's no hand holding which is the nicest part about it. Um, if you want to make a proofer, a quick proofer to do your bread, you can do um, a, uh, you can put a pan of, um, of water in your microwave, heat it up until it's about, um, oh, I don't know, maybe five minutes till it's kind of boiling and steamy. Take the pan out and put your bread in there, your dough in there, and it will rise really nicely because the bread likes, your bread dough likes that texture in that environment. Um, let's try, and then you're baking it. When you bake your bread, when you break it either in a bread machine or you bake it by hand, the best way to store your breads is to slice it and then put it in a baggie and stick it in the freezer. Now I usually leave the bread out on the counter wrapped for a couple of days and slice off what I want then and then the rest of it I slice and put in the freezer. Um, it, it don't put it in the freezer whole and then let it thaw and slice it because my experience is that most breads will crumble when you do that. So I think with those tools in mind you'll find that you can have great success with just about every bread that you make. Um, and now I think we've got some time for some questions. My bread's going to be done ooh, in about 11 minutes, so we'll have some bread to sample shortly. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. Is it necessary to put oil? It is my, if I can hear you, I'm, I'm barely hearing you, but is it, um, you're asking if you put oil, to put oil in the, in the recipe? Um, I like to use a little bit of oil, about three tablespoons is what I use. You could use applesauce in place of it. I would use one tablespoon of oil if possible. Um, butter instead? Sure, yes, and you'd want to use melted butter in most cases, unless you're doing a brioche. Yeah, sure. Oh, the ratio of flour to liquid? Well, the formula is um, its not set in stone because what you want to do is find those ratios that work for you. In the case of these recipes, it's about three and a half cups of flour, flour blend, to one and three quarters cups of liquid plus the eggs. Okay, you're welcome. And if you keep that ratio, once you like the recipes, then you'll find that everything that you do with substitutions will work out fine. Okay, uh, yes ma'am. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. I do. My books are at um, the Gluten Free and More table. Um, and then also this um, this magazine is there as well. Now I was going to say, um, did I hand out, I think the sheets got passed around that you can sign up for my newsletter um, and we should start a sheet if anybody wants me to email these recipes to them. Okay, good. Because I'm happy to, and here's my, um, um, my email address. Um, I have a few cards here if anybody wants them so that you can contact me directly if you like those recipes and you didn't contact me before. I'm happy to do that. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good question. How long does the mix stay in the refrigerator? The mix really can stay, I mean, once you've mixed it all up, probably six months to um, nine months would be fine and if you want to leave it longer I don't recommend this but you could put it in the freezer um, I only freeze like my almond flour and some of and flax meal because those are they get rancid very quickly or brown rice flour but the thing is that you really want everything all your ingredients to be at room temperature when you start making your breads so you would have to take it out and let it uh, warm to room temperature for a little bit 
if you use the Zojirushi, and I don't know about the other machines, some of the others do this too, and you use the gluten-free cycle, it has a really long rest cycle in which everything warms. Um, it's like 30 minutes or longer. So you could actually use everything at room temperature or cool, and you're still gonna have a good bread. This time I started with warmer ingredients. Other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, is this xanthan gum? Yes, xanthan gum, yes. Now, can you not have xanthan gum? Is that what you're, or you do use xanthan gum. If you can't have xanthan gum, you could use guar gum. Um, or you could use um, agar, agar, or you can use psyllium fiber husk if you wanted to. Um, I have a recipe in this book that for a French bread baguette and it uses psyllium fiber and it's pretty cool. I really, uh, it's a, it was very successful. I liked it a lot. Any other questions? I'm going to advance this bread and take it out. Um, it's only got seven minutes left and I'm going to, I want you to try it before you go. That's the, the reason I'm going to do that. I'm just looking for, oh, I got something here I can take that out with. Okay. So I'm going to wait till it's five minutes and then I'm just two more minutes and then I'm going to take it out so you can taste it. Thank you. Um, so are there any other questions meanwhile? Have any of you had failures with your breads that you think you understand now or that I could help you with? Um, and how many of you have used some of the other flowers, like quinoa flour, amaranth flour, sorghum flour? Any of you are using those and having success with it? Maybe. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, good. Yes. You know, people say that all the time. Uh, truthfully, I think you're getting some bad boys in there. Um, because I think that if you have the right ratio of your wet to dry ingredients, it should bake in the standard amount of time. You know, I really have never had that experience. I know that's kind of one of the things that I'm reading a lot about these days and I'm going, I don't know. I mean, I've never had that experience. So this is 55 minutes. This will be your standard for any bread that you're doing in here. And um, it seems to work well. Now you all, I think you have a handout. And it has the programmable cycle on there, which is really a big help if you're doing a custom um, cycle. Okay, I'm going to, this reached five minutes, I'm going to stop it and pretend it's done. It's a few minutes under, but I think it's going to be okay. And I'm going to take this out so that it will cool for us in a couple minutes. Hold on, I've got to put this down. <laughs> All right. I had um whoops, let me turn that over so you can see how nice it is. So that's the way my bread looks all the time. Do any of you remember Betty Hagman? She was one of the first bakers and cooks and cookbook writers in the gluten-free arena. And she used to say to me, how do you get your bread to rise so much? And again, it's the same question as gluten-free breads have to bake longer. I don't know, I expect this out of my bread. I mean, it has got to rise and it's got to have that dome. And perhaps it's like children. You know, if you expect them to excel, they're going to excel. And I think that's the same thing with bread. <laughs> I mean, I think there may be a little more to it than that, but you know, I always seek this standard. And it really is gorgeous bread. My only complaint about this 
is a very large slice of bread. I'm used to, when I buy bread, I get those little tiny slices, they're like tea breads. And so, I mean, it's a lot more calories, so I really have to cut it thin in order to be able to, um, uh, to enjoy it. Um, I'm not gonna cut this just yet because it needs to cool a little bit. Um, so I think we'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more if that's okay with you. I think we've got a few more minutes um, and then we can slice it up and you can all try it. Because uh, I'd love to have you try this bread as well. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what's in the bread and which I, what um, flours I used. And so I'm going to look it up because of course I can't remember it off the top of my head. And I want to show you, um, this is the way all of my breads look. This is the, on the, on the right, this is a dairy free bread and it's the Italian sesame bread. And it's got a wonderful crust. And down in the corner, or, or up here, is the oat flour, oat molasses bread, which is really yummy too. Any of you, uh, do most of you use oat flour or no? No oat flour okay for you? Good, because I think it's really got a lot of protein in it and it's great. Um, there's a picture of me in here hugging my bread machine, which I do love. <laughs> and this is the, um, the multigrain is here and then the pumpernickel is below that. And again, you can see the wonderful texture, the even holes. That's what you're looking for when you're doing a bread. It's dense and chewy, but it's not like, like you have to maw it and chew and chew and chew like that methyl cellulose stuff. It's really tasty and, and, and really satisfying. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Oh, which magazine? It's gluten-free and more. It's the, I think it's the June, oh, um, let's see, June, July issue. Yes, it's the summer, oh, August, September issue. And it's, we do have it in this, at the table. Um, so if you want to get a copy of it, you can. And if you don't, come see me and I'll email you the PDF for the article. Yes, sir. The yeast to flour, well the yeast is usually, I use one tablespoon for my three and a half cups for the two pound loaf, or the one and a half to two pound loaf. Um, you could use a little bit less if you wanted to. If you get the mixes and you have a packet in there, the packet, seven gram packet is two and a quarter teaspoons. So if you're trying to use a jar of yeast, which is much more economical, um, you want to measure out two and a quarter teaspoons. I think baking powder and yeast are two things that I think um, a little extra helps the breads because they are heavier. Um, but if you do too much, you're going to get an overpowering yeasty taste or baking powder metallic taste. So you don't want to do those. Um, I want to tell you, some, of, some people have asked me, they've said I can't have yeast. And I'm imagining everybody here can. But if you were curious about doing something that was yeast free, you could do baking soda uh, and baking powder instead. And Jewel Shepard, who's in the booth right next to me, has a wonderful recipe in her book um, which is the Special Diets book, I think replacing, I can't remember the title of it, but it's a, it is a nice book. Um, and she's right next to us, and she has that great recipe in her book. So, okay, I'm gonna try cutting this now. Um, and let's see, I hope I brought the knife out. That's the only thing. I'm wondering, do we have a volunteer who can help me for a second? Um, who's my volunteer? Okay, in the back, there should be a little serrated knife. And if you could bring that out for me, that would be a great help, because I think I must have left it in there when I brought everything else out that I needed. Do you have, oh, oh I you yes, help. yes, oh, I do, yeah, uh, I do. Now I don't have, I don't know what happened to all my napkins. I had them here before, but, oh, that's good. That's perfect, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've got to put this down again so I can slice this. And re remember, this is warm. 
Yesterday I made one of these and I sliced a piece off, came back, and somebody had sliced off the rest of it, except for a little tiny bit and taken it. It was still hot. <laughs> okay, hold on. If any of you have any questions, meanwhile, come on up and I'll answer your questions. And I think we have, you know what we've got here is, um, we've got paper towels. Yes, please, that would be a great help. So, and if any of you are leaving, thank you. If anyone's leaving, thank you for coming.